My dad used to encourage me to fail. Mm. So at the dinner mm. table growing up, he would ask my brother and me what we failed at that week. Wow. And if we didn't have something to tell him, he'd be disappointed. And I vividly remember being a little girl and saying, I tried out for this dad and I was horrible. And he would high five me. And he'd go, way to go. Wow. So he was reframing my definition mm. of failure. So yeah. failure for me became about not trying, not the outcome. Mm. My definition of greatness would be going for it no matter what, despite fear, and making the absolute most of the life that you are given because it's not a dress rehearsal. A lot of people think that Spanx started when I cut the feet out of my pantyhose, but actually it started long before that. It started when I was selling fax machines door to door and getting my car business card ripped up in my face, being escorted out of buildings all day, every day, that I woke up one day and just thought, I'm in the wrong movie. Like, how did this happen? This is not my life. Yeah. Cut, scene, director, like, call the producer. And I got out a piece of paper and I wrote down, what am I good at? And the only thing in the good column was sales. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do with that? And I ended up writing in my journal, I'm going to invent a product and sell it to millions of people that will make them feel good. And then I asked the universe for an idea. And I was very specific. And it took two years. And I only cut the feet out of my pantyhose one time. And I was not going to squander any idea the universe gave me because I had really asked for it. And then the minute I cut the feet out, I started trying to make it. I started looking up manufacturers on the internet. So I called and called and no one would take my call and they'd either hang up on me or say they weren't interested. So I took a week off of work and drove and around there. in person. Anyway, I went into the, ho the manufacturing plants and they asked me the same three questions. And you are, let's say, Sarah Blakely. And you're with like, uh, myself Sarah Blakely, <laughs> and you're financially backed by and I was like Sarah Blakely so you can imagine how those went it's like well have a nice day honey and good luck yeah. and um, about you know a few weeks after I made all those rounds I got a call from a guy in North Carolina who had took pity on me mm. and said Sarah I've decided to make your crazy idea Wow. I'm gonna ask why at the change of heart he said I have three daughters yeah, so he ran the idea by them, and they're like, Dad, that sounds interesting. you got to give that girl a chance. Ted became my buddy, and I went to get it patented, but all the patent lawyers wanted between three and $5,000, and I had $5,000 set aside to do this. That's it, yeah. So I wrote my own patent. I went to Barnes & Noble. No way. And I bought a book called Patents and Trademarks, and I wrote the patent, and then I called one of the patent lawyers that was the nicest to me, and said, please, 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 will you write the claims over the weekend for a discounted price? Mm. I've done all the other rest of the patent. Yeah. I had no money to advertise. It was risky. It was fun. Mm. At the time, listen, now it's become a household name. But when I first invented it, I would call people and say, hi, I'm Sarah from Spikes. And they would hang up. Yeah, they thought I was pranking them. I'm called. I'm like, no, really, I'm Sarah. And my company really is called Spanx. And I had a department stores across the country that wouldn't sell it. They thought it was too risque of really? a name. Yeah. Named it Spanx. It came to me because I narrowed down my thinking. I knew that Kodak and Coca-Cola were the two most recognized names in the world at the time. And I thought, what do they have in common? I like to think about words mm -hmm. and phrases a lot. They both had a strong K sound in them. And the man that created Kodak liked the K sound so much, he took a K and put it in the beginning and the end of the word and played with letters in the alphabet. So, and I also had a bunch of friends who did stand-up comedy, and it's this weird trade secret among comedians that the K sound will make your audience laugh. So I put all that together and I'm like, okay, I want my product name to have the K sound in it for good luck. And literally Spanx came across my dashboard in my car in my mind and I pulled off the side of the road. I wrote it down. I went home that night. I typed it in my computer for $150 with my credit card. And at the last second, I backspaced the K and the S and put in an X. Wow. So that was the hard part. And then once I had it, I cold called Neiman Marcus. And that was the first account I called on. Did you get it? Yes. 
Well, you were great at sales, well, so listen, you could sell it. I was so excited. It was my moment. I flew to Dallas. I called them and said, if you give me 10 minutes of your time, I'll come and meet with you. And she said, all right. It was the buyer? Uh, yep, the oh. buyer. I first called the Atlanta store. They're like, girl, um, we can't help you. We have a buying office. I'm like, well, where is that? Give me their yeah. number. Wow. And um, I went in, and halfway through my pitch, I could tell I was losing her. So I said, you know what? Will you please come to the bathroom with me? And she was like so buttoned up. I mean, Neiman Marcus, right. like her pen matched her belt that matched her shoes. And she was like, what? Like, what am I going to do in the bathroom? I know. I was like, just call me to the bathroom and show you my own panty line. And I went in the stall with Spanx in my pants and without it in my pants. And she was like, oh, I totally get it. It's awesome. And I'm going to put it in seven stores. And that's what Neiman's ordered. And then I sent them to the, se- they sent them to the seven stores. I had no packing and shipping department. So the semi trucks were pulling up to my apartment in Atlanta and I was oh shipping my God. them myself to Neiman. This is amazing. And um, then I called every friend I had in those seven cities. Like people I hadn't talked to in 20 years. Hey, go buy a few of these. Go <laughs> make, yeah. Take your girlfriends there. Hi, Christina, remember me? I used to sit next to you all the time <laughs> in grade school. <laughs> Will you please go buy this product called Spanx? I literally called them and I said, and I'll mail you a check. So I paid all my friends and friends of friends to go buy the product. That is brilliant, actually, and I said, to get some movement. Yeah, I said, go in. I, said, I gave him a whole script. I'm like, go in and say, I've been looking for this all my life. I can't believe it's here. And create all this excitement. This is amazing. And then, of course, a week later, the ne- I talked to the Neiman's buyer, and she's like, Sarah, we are blowing out. I'm like, you don't say. No way. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was buying them all. That's yeah. That's brilliant. You have to. Wow. You have you to. You have to momentum. ensure your own success. Absolutely. So then once I started running out of money, Oprah called and put it on as her favorite product of the year. How long was that for until the time was in Neiman Marcus to Oprah calling? Like a month. It just happened that quick? A month or a month and a half. How did she even hear about it in a month I and a half? I sent it to her in a gift basket. And her Andre, who dresses her, put it in her dressing room and she put them on and no. has basically worn them every day since. Shut up. I'm not kidding. It was so unbelievable. I had no money to advertise. In the back of my apartment, I was selling fax machines like a month before that. But I have to say I was working every night and on the weekends for two years, quietly trying to get this made. Building this thing, yeah. Building it. This is amazing. So would you have... Um, where would you be uh, if Oprah didn't pick it up within the first couple months? Like if you had a year of trying to do this on your own, do you think you'd have got out of the press or you'd, you'd have yeah, got money I to do. build it? Okay. I do, because I was so determined. I mean, what, as soon as so I got committed. the order, I was so committed. You weren't so just interested in seeing if this worked. You no. were committed and doing whatever it takes. I was in it to win it. You have to remember, wow. right? I was selling fax machines to being years. thrown out of buildings. I had no option in my mind. I was like, I am scripting a new life for myself. Yeah, but when I got Neiman Marcus, I think a lot of people think that's when you have arrived. No. That's when I double timed. I mean, I I got um, on a plane and was gone for two years straight, and I went to every department store in the country that sold Spanx, every Neiman Sachs, Nordstrom, and Bloomingdale's, and I would go before the store opened and do an all-store rally and tell them what my product was, explain it to them, do a demo, give out free product, and then stand there in the department for you know, eight hours a day and tell customers what it was because I didn't have any money to advertise. I was selling it for them, but what I didn't realize I was doing was I was building a sales force, not on my payroll because all these people started to become so... Ambassadors. Ambassadors, and they were rooting for me and they loved the product. And so that was a really important part of the formula. And then I learned what my next products were going to be because I was standing right there with customers and all these... say what they need, what the challenge is. I can't do this. They told me what they wanted. Amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, I went from, you know, when I saw somebody order that wasn't my mom's friend, I was dancing around my apartment and then to all of a sudden 30,000 orders. Like it was just... Was this online at the time? Yes. It was on Spanx.com. Wow. Yeah. 30,000 came in, and how, what type of uh, time frame? Yeah, um, pretty quickly. Like a week? Yeah. 30,000 orders. Like in a, in a week or two. Yeah, it was crazy. I was up all night, every night, shipping. I had friends coming over, helping me pack and ship them. And this is how clueless I was. I was sending everybody's product in regular mail. 
So then I started getting all these emails and phone calls from people going, my product never showed up and I didn't have any way to track it. I was like, oh, oh okay. I guess they're supposed to be tracking with this. <laughs> so <laughs> FedEx and everything else. Yeah, wow. So then I, you know, that's how I did the whole thing. I stumbled through it. I always tell Figured people, what you don't know can be your greatest asset if you let it because Absolutely. it ensures you're going to do it differently. Absolutely. And when I landed Neiman Marcus, all these people came up to me and said, I have been doing this for seven years, 10 years, five years. How did you land Neiman Marcus? And I said, I called them. And they just looked at me and I was like, why, what do you do? They're like, well, I go to trade shows and I set up my booth and I'm waiting for the Neiman Marcus fire to come by. And we've been doing it every year for seven years. I didn't even know there were trade shows. So sometimes just not knowing how it's supposed to be done. You have to have the courage though to, to say, even though I wasn't trained in this, because a lot of people think, well, I didn't go to school for this, so how could I possibly know? But you know, it's inside of you. Yeah. And you're willing to be creative mm-hmm. and, and risk, you know, failure in a, in a way that uh, most people aren't. You put yourself out there in a major way and you said, hey, come to the bathroom with me. Right. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do anything weird. You know? <laughs> Yeah. It's amazing. It's an incredible story. I believe money just makes you more of who you already were. So if you were kind, you're going to be kinder. If you're a jerk, become a bigger jerk. Right. You yeah. know, insecure, you become more insecure. I, I see it as a magnifying glass, like, you know, money. So money didn't change me. It doesn't feel weird to me to, to you know, for me, it was really about, I was so inspired to make a product that was going to make a difference and make people feel good and especially women I feel like the industry had stopped caring about how we felt in our clothing and I was really I wanted to take that angle of like no I do believe we can feel good and look good at the same time it doesn't have to be like close and you know I I think just you said what people don't know about me so I was trying to think about it but I'm most proud of the fact that um, that I was able to to achieve this in a really um, kind way you know that I can look at myself in the mirror and just I am where I am and I feel really good about it really good about myself I didn't feel like I had to compromise you know when I first started Spanx I was at a cocktail party and three guys came up to me and they said Sarah we heard you just started a a business and invented something and I said yes and they go you know business is war and I just looked at them and, and and then one guy, you know, pat me on the back and he said, yeah, I hope you're up for it. I hope you're ready for war. Wow. And I went home that night in my apartment and I sat down on the floor and I literally started crying. And I remember thinking, I don't want to go to war. Like, why does it have to be war? I want to go about this in a completely different way. And so the whole journey of Spanx, I really took a feminine approach to it. I mean, I, I, def- I didn't know business. I'd never taken a business class. I didn't have a business plan. I didn't go out and raise VC, so I trusted my gut. I stuck with intuition. I, you know, just did things what felt very, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think traditional business has been very male energy, and so I wanted to see what would happen if I took a very feminine energy approach. 